Hello, everyone. It's Brian Hunt, your host, and welcome to another episode of Risk On, Risk Off. Uh, as we know, in these, my kind of general line theory as far as theme of these episodes is talking about risk and how it applies to our lives. And that can be obviously insurance and business economy management, but also could be what can be happening with respects to geopolitical events. And we've had the pleasure of having some fantastic authors on this show in recent uh, weeks. But um, like they say in all things, timing is everything. And I had the fortune to go to the Texas Tribune Festival uh, about five weeks ago, which I loved. And if you're an intellectually curious person, I would highly recommend people go attend that. And it was just three days of wonderful seminars and conversations with very smart leading individuals in their field. And I got to excited when I saw this um, individual was on the panel because I just read her book uh, not too long ago, The Devil Never Sleeps. And I really wanted to sit down and listen to this panel and I had the good fortune to introduce myself to her because I think a lot of what I talk about and what I do with aligns with what she does. And yeah, you know, it's kind of say that if in the world of risks, there's certain people who are good at it and there are certain people who are on the Jedi Council. And I think it's very fair to say that uh, my host and my guest definitely sits on the, on the Jedi Council. So it's a great distinct honor to have Miss Juliet Kayyem on the show. Juliet, welcome to the show. Great to see you. Hi. This is my first like live LinkedIn thing. Really? I mean, all the things you do with podcasts. And I, being know, on CNN, I know. I so. know. I was my I was my son has a late start today, so he was here. I was like, I have to get on. And he's like, he's like, I was. He's like, why are you so nervous? I was like, I don't know. It's a new platform. <laughs> There's well, so I'm, many platforms. Well, I'm honored that you're. I'm your first LinkedIn live I know. Uh, show. So Hi, everyone. Hi, Juliet. Thank you so much for being on the show. I mean, I'm ecstatic to have you here. I know you're pressed. You've been all over the. I've been seeing all over CNN this past weekend as far as what's going on with Hamas and how that might spill over to the United States. Uh, but I just love the opportunity to talk to you about your background and specifically business continuity planning, disaster planning, and then also we want to delve into the article you recently wrote in the Atlantic, respects mm -hmm. to how global warming is impacting. Um, you know, insurance. And I, I, I listened to a recent podcast, Julie, and I was very taken with the term that when it came to insurance, you started going down the rabbit hole. Yeah. <laughs> it was scary. It's well for someone who practices insurance. I can tell you. My, my husband was like, get out. Get out. Like, it's so <laughs> fascinating. He's like. Awesome. Well, so Julia, before we get to start, I'll just my background real quick, but um, play the old game. I know you probably some young kids. So if we're playing, you know, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? Where in the world is Juliet Kayim today? Oh, I am in, um, I'm actually in my home office, Cambridge, Mass. I'm okay. uh, back from travel this weekend, leave again tomorrow. Uh, my kids are older. I got two in college, one in actually London right now. Oh, wow. One who um, is uh, not too far away. And then I have my third is a senior. So um uh we're we're you know talk about um talk about risk calculations we are yes. we're gaming the college application process um but he presses go today so oh it's wow all done or he, i say we he's all done i'm, I'm <laughs> done checking does the period go before the quotation mark or not but yes so i'm here in cambridge i'll head over to campus i'm a, a professor at the kennedy school and i have a, actually a big event there this afternoon um uh, uh, for like, you know, students and affiliates and stuff. Yeah, Julia, I mean, obviously your, your background is amazing. And it is impressive. Obviously you attended Harvard, you went to Harvard Law School, um, part of a Homeland Security part with under the Obama administration. And obviously you did Homeland Security or disaster planning for during the state, Massachusetts. And so, I mean, everybody knows your background is phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, obviously... I think what I love to talk about, Julia, and we want to get into more in depth on the insurance, but just the whole concept as far mm -hmm. as is, there's like we term maybe saying early in your poly crisis, and it just yeah. seems like we're being flooded with these yeah. different types of crises that maybe five years ago people like you and I were thinking about, but now everybody's having to think about. Yeah. What do you? I mean, the quick overview. How do you view the world right now? And that's something like as far as world and national security, as far as all these things that have been going on with the pandemic, supply chains. Yeah. It, it, it seems like it. It gets, it gets you kind of stressed out. Like, it like, is. It is. I'm, I mean, that was the purpose of the book. I, I You know, my biography is in some ways, uh, my professional biography is in some ways uh, uh, reflective of it. I started off in counterterrorism. I, I'm, I'm a lawyer by training, as you noted. And I was yeah. a, like I was a litigator for five years of my career at the Department of Justice. And I started off in counterterrorism and um, I actually started off in civil rights and then sort of moved into counterterrorism. They're, they're related in many ways. Mm -hmm. So, um, so like from 95 to 2005, I was squarely in, in that field, which obviously 
uh, well, you know, five people were in it before 9-11, a, you know, a million people were in it after, um, but really um, was focused on, um, you know, sort of legal issues surrounding counterterrorism. And then, and, you know, I put it casually, and I don't mean it so, but like, you know, basically stopping 19 guys from getting on four airplanes, right? Sure. And I had a professional moment or change um, during Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina. I was out of government at the time, um, but I would, um, uh, um, but it, uh, it was, I would re-enter actually the next year because I would go into state government, but it was about, you know, it, it sort of showed that like, if you focus on one thing, you know, you can't save an American city from drowning. And I really then got into what I would call sort of right of boom planning, which is sort of the, the, you know, the, the sort of response, recovery, resiliency, and, and actually it sort of stayed in that as, as a Homeland Security official in state government, then, then senior official in federal government. And now in academia, private sector, I do still a lot of public safety, uh, public safety and, and, um, uh, and and political training in this and um and then and then of course the writing and cnn and stuff and so that combination of things really is about uh, a devil or the boom it's very agnostic all yeah. hazards and really thinking about well i'm not going to worry so much about risk um and is it a black swan or a gray rhino or whatever combination of you know things that we want to put it and i I'm going to think about and, and advise and train on, on what I would call, you know, how to fail safer. Correct. In other words, I'm going to assume the bad thing. And then my measure of success is, is it less bad because of the investments in it? And that's, it's not to say I don't want that, you know, you know, it's not fatalistic. It is just, you know, are, are because of what you know, right. Is it the cyber or the pandemic or the radicalization or the climate or whatever? I, I can't, um, uh, uh, it cannot be that we measure success by whether bad things don't happen because I, I can't get there. Yeah. Right? But I can measure success in, is, am I anticipating that boom? And then is, you know, did I fail safer because I invested in the preparedness and the training and the comms planning and stuff? And that's what, and that's basically what I do. I'm really agnostic about, um, uh, agnostic is wrong word, but I'm really agnostic about what the threat would be and then thinking about uh, minimizing the consequences. Yeah, Julia, I think everything you just said there sort of really tracks with sort of how my career has evolved. Like say yeah. 20 years ago, uh, I'm a CPA by background. I used to yeah. do forensic accounting and I used to do claims analysis for property damage and time element after the event occurred. Yeah. And so I started learning how people 20 years ago, and I'd still say the case, don't necessarily think or plan for backup plans, business continuity planning, yeah. their mitigation. What are they gonna do to shift product, burn through backup inventory? And then I went and joined a, a FM Global, which is like yeah. the world's largest commercial property yeah. here. And we were part of this group. They hired the forensic accountants like me to travel the country and the world working with Fortune 1000 companies because they were starting to see they had property damage, but the actual time element or business interruption losses were getting bigger than they anticipated because globalization, interdependencies. How do you track that and think about that? So what we were doing is traveling, doing biz impact analysis, trying yeah. to understand the event exactly. before it occurred. To help us a keystone, as you know, for business continuity management and planning. So you plan for the worst and hope for the best. Because, yes. and I read your book. I love the term when you talk about the boom. And I really got into that as far as the military analysis. You have yeah. the event, the boom. So there's left of it from like a timeline to plan for, identify, hope for, make plans, and then boom, where you react to it after yeah. the boom. And like I say, planning, you don't do your plan after the boom, you no. do your plan before the boom. Right. And you don't and you don't base. I mean, I had sort of two things about the book, which was, well, just sort of taking a step back. What I wanted to do and what I do now is is find the connective tissue across all of these sort of booms and booms and right. Yeah, yeah. Because what we have a tendency to do is is, you know, oh, our risk calculation and blah, 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 is this going to happen or whatever? And we treat each thing as sort of, you know, random and rare. Well, we know that that's just ridiculous. And our doctrine is really far behind, as you know, on this yeah. as well. Um, we'll talk about insurance maybe being ahead of ahead of the public sector yeah. in this regard. And so thinking about sort of what's that connective tissue across all of these different disasters. And then if I can, you know, get eight lessons out of it, then, then it doesn't seem so unfamiliar because everything, honestly, everything starts to look the same. It's, and then therefore the preparation starts to look the same. And I think from, uh, from a risk, you know, people in risk, 
have a tendency to, to I think, you know, want to calculate what it is mm -hmm. and not really thinking about, well, what's the, what's the, what are the commonalities if the thing were to happen? I think cyber security traditionally had been the worst in this regard, that everyone was focused on stopping the bad thing from happening. And then when the boom happens, everyone's like, oh, what? Like, you know, like, oh, the, you know, colonial pipeline. Wait, the pipelines went down. Well, you know. so, it, it, so it, that's, that's, I mean, I, 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 completely agree with you on that and that and that's sort of the the goal is to make it more accessible because it becomes more familiar and this boom concept is sort of left of boom right of boom and it's yeah. the same as the military is you know we have is is to conceptualize sort of the boom moment you, you read the books you know there's mm -hmm. a sort of refrain that you are here right that yep. you're not before it you're not after it you're at the boom and what I teach my students, I teach at a school of public policy. I teach at the Kennedy School. And, you know, they're taking classes on housing and poverty and whatever. And what's the difference between those policy issues and, and the one that we face in crisis management is I'm looking at my post Peloton hair. Sorry. And, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> I'm like, what is that? So, but um, uh, so, you know, what I what I want my students to remember and what I say is is. is you know, we have a tendency to put crisis on everything, housing crisis, cancer crisis, environmental crisis. What is different about the crises that you and I think about is three is defined by three things. One is it's a it's a disruption to your core capability. So it's mm -hmm. not everything. Things are going to go wrong or whatever. We're sort of used to them. Two, it um, it is in time, at least it is unanticipated. Right. It may have been predicted because you're thinking, oh, I could get disrupted. But the exact moment is is not known. And Third is um, that your response time between that boom and catastrophe is very short. And that's what makes it different than, say, a housing crisis or even a border crisis, right? Like your, your tools are short. So, you know, we say, as you know, like your runway is short. So you only have two options. Be, be ready for the crash landing or try to extend your one runway. And that's yeah. honestly, I don't, you know, I don't minimize what we do, but yeah. it's it's not conceptually difficult. We're not, you know, I'm not making the vaccine, right? You know, it's like, it's like, um, and so that's how I like to think about it. It's like, think about that runway. When, yeah. when that plane is coming in, you know, what do you, well, I, you know, I wish I had a lot of ambulances there, or I wish I, yeah. I wish I had two more minutes, right, to, to think about it. So for everybody who's watching the show, um, if you haven't done it before, if you look in the bottom right-hand corner, you should see an oval next to my face. Um, you type in your question, and I'll be able to bring it to oh, Ms. Yes. Uh, Kayim's attention. And then we've got a first question. But to that point, Julia, I want to take a quote from your book, which I think is perfect. And you say, we're talking about booms. They are all booms. Yes. Disaster management is about being ready for any boom in any shape for whatever the devil brings. And I think that is the core yeah. of it, is that you've got to it, – it, as Eisenhower said, plans are – I mean, nothing – it's the training that comes with it and so your people can respond and you know how to react once the event occurs. Because yeah. you're not going to pull out a book and read it during the event. During the yeah. event, you're going to respond. And that's, I think, yeah. quarter. No, I told you about. I'm going to Las Vegas tomorrow. And I mean, it's, you know, I'm just doing an executive level, you know, training. Uh, and, and you know, I mean, the, 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 the two hours spent just testing mm -hmm. the basics is fa fabulous. I mean, you know, and I also like for people listening here in the space, like a lot of time will be like, I need eight hours with these people. No, they're not going to give you eight hours. The CEO is not going to give, but if you can do it in two hours, well, that's more muscle memory than they had before. Amen. Amen. All right. So we've got our first question. This Woo! is Mr. Shiloh Rowe. What do you feel will be the impact today if another strike happened on U.S. lands, not necessarily another 9-11, but similar results? Okay. Oh, How wow. would today's U.S. society react? Yeah. So you mean something in between, um, uh, uh, you know, the the lone wolf, which I think we've learned to sort of adapt to and yeah. investigate, and say like you know a, a terror attack. So it so the, the the quintessential question here is: Would it you know are the are the is the enemy uh, domestic or foreign? Because mm -hmm. as we now know, the threat of organized terror is probably less than it was two years ago, but still exists it, mm -hmm. domestically. And so, yeah, so yeah. I, and I, I do think that the impact of, of a domestic threat 
would be very different. One, your tools are different. We're familiar with the, you know, that there are neighbors and whatever. So I think that that, that uh, would be different. I think on the foreign side, um, uh, our tools are more limited in, in a weird way. Our tools are more limited mm -hmm. uh, depending on if it's state sponsor sponsored or not. I mean, for one is military engagement as a response. I mean, we're, we're dealing with this now with Israel and Hamas, like military engagement in response to terror is really hard. Terrorists is really hard, right? Because, you know, either they you're, you're going into, um, uh, sovereign territory and making a statement about that. And we did that with Pakistan and bin Laden, or you risk um, uh, harming civilians or the innocents, and then you're worried about greater radicalization, right? So, so I mean, I'm not putting military stuff off the table, but I would, yeah. I would, I would suspect that there would be more law enforcement and covert action, uh, depending just because of, you know, the resources and what we learn from, from um, uh, from uh, uh, Afghanistan, which is, you know, what, and this is the Israeli debate, like what happens day two? Well, if you mm -hmm. don't have a plan to get out, yeah. get your guy and get out, you're, you're stuck, you know, trying to maintain a country for 20 years. And then look what happens when, when you leave. On the response side, I will say for all of our flaws, you know, everyone looks at Uvalde and stuff. There really is. I mean, these investments really have changed the way that we respond. We're we're much more um, uh, uh, unified, much more training on state, local, state, and federal interaction. Much greater response capabilities. The public is engaged in ways that they hadn't been. I mean, think about nine eleven. I I remember I was my my the daughter I was telling you about is a senior in college. She was five weeks old on nine eleven, mm -hmm. and I'm not trained. My daughter was five weeks old on 9-11. Yeah, August. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. and um, and I'm on a train to New York, and I'm in counterterrorism, and and I, you know, so like there's like five people that the media knows that are in the space, and they're all calling it. And I remember questions were like, you know, who is Bin Laden, and like, mm -hmm. I mean, they were so basic. We're much more acclimated to the potential for the threat, and I think that yeah. makes us actually safer. This is the. The, the devil is coming. We, can, yeah. we can't be surprised. So, Jill, I want to pivot because obviously I could, we could go down this. I could talk to you this forever and you know, I get limited time with you. <laughs> but uh, let's talk. I really want to talk about your article recently in The Atlantic. My rabbit hole? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I know. I'm debating. I'm debating. I have I have some writing projects I'm working on now, but yeah. I'm debating if in the new year I want to. That should be my next book. It's, I, 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 it's so fascinating. Mm. Um, and it is, isn't it? He's in insurance. Yeah. I, I, I want to be you because, it, I mean, just the policy well, issue well, Julie, is really hard. Julie, it's funny because we can have this conversation. I want to be you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I tell people when I was like, long story, I used to, I went to high school in Connecticut and I moved there. My parents, I went to Texas, my parents were in Connecticut. I lived outside Hartford. Everybody in the planet. Oh, yes. Everyone's in insurance. insurance. And I thought, oh, God, this is boring. I don't want to do insurance. I'm never going to do insurance. Well, my life sort of twists and turns, and now here I am in insurance program. So am I. I sort of view my. I feel I, I want to be an honorary insurance, but but so I'll make it. I'll make that happen. You know, look, this is this is this is the the. Um, I, I'm I'm careful to stick to my lane, even with the Hamas Israel stuff. I stick to my counterterrorism lane. No. I can't solve the Middle East problem. Um, but um, but it just became clear that insurance was my lane, right? In yeah. terms of disaster management risk, because of all the debates out of California and certainly Florida about what were insurance companies telling us about disasters mm -hmm. and why the heck weren't we listening, right? Yes. And and um, and it became clear. So I, I'm a, a contributing writer for the Atlantic, and and it was funny because I said, you know, there's this issue, and they're like. Oh really? And then, for whatever reason, there just were there was a lot of more public commentary on it. And then I mm -hmm. think I just sort of put all the pieces together in my piece. And my basic argument was that you know we can hate insurance companies, we can hate insurers, we can hate claims, we can hate our new rates, whatever. But but you know you know don't kill the canary if the you know if the canary is still alive don't kill the canary it's the coal mine that's like mm -hmm. ringing and what what i focused on which i found fascinating 
um, and people in Texas and Florida will certainly know this. But I looked at California because you couldn't get a bluer state, right? Yep. The, the entire state apparatus is blue. There's a, 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 you know, there's a very small Republican Party on congressional side, but in state government, your 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 you know governor, or lieutenant governor, or attorney general, state mm -hmm. com insurance commission, everyone's a Democrat, and everyone believes in climate change, right? Mm -hmm. Every, they're not they're not doubters, right? Yeah. And their structure was like. I mean, you couldn't you couldn't believe it, and I and I I don't mean to criticize it in the sense like it had a good motivation. It was it was it was wanted to protect consumers yeah. from abuses by insurance companies. But what yeah. happened over the years is it became so consumer friendly that that you couldn't adapt to changes fast enough, and those changes clearly were coming from climate. California has subsequently to that piece, um, which I heard pissed off some people, which is fine. That's yeah. That's it. good. That's the point. In, in California state government um, uh, was that they have made the, some some of the appropriate changes in terms of rate increases, but more importantly, you know, um, uh, in terms of the mapping, right? Yeah. The, the people who know California know that they had a prohibition on the use of fire mapping for uh, risk assessments. Well, well uh, future fire mapping is like, well, like I thought we were the people, you know, I'm a Democrat. Like I thought we were the people who believe in science and believe, yep. in, you know, yep. in mapping and whatever. So they've gotten rid of that um, mm -hmm. with the appropriate consumer protections that insurance companies have to relate. Well, what are they basing uh, these insurance uh, changes on? So it's just, it was, it was that kind of the conflict between the public rules mm -hmm. that um, were created, you know, this is a little bit like my book, that were created at a time when we weren't anticipating this kind of world that we live in. And the private sector that wants to make money, it's not fun for an insurance company to get out of California, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. people are like, oh, they're just, I was like, it's a huge deal for all states to not do new claims in yep. California. It's a big market. They, yep. they want to make money. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the that was the challenge, and that was the rabbit hole that I emerged from <laughs> unscathed. It's it's so interesting. It, I like, it, like, I mean, can I just like say why? As yeah. an aside, if we're waiting yeah. for questions, but yeah. like one thing is the extent to which insurance has played such a pivotal role in our societal. Um, norms, our cultural norms from, mm -hmm. honestly, from the slave trade and the insurance of boats mm -hmm. to uh, the Montgomery bus boycott. And, you know, one way that um, that segregationists um, uh, pushed back was uh, they started to deny insurance for drivers that were taking uh, uh, African-Americans supporting uh, the boycott. Mm -hmm. You just think of all these ways in which, you know, women in insurance and their inability to get insurance, um, except through marriage. I mean, you think of all these ways that insurance has either, you know, reflected our horrors yep. uh, or pushed for change. No, and uh, to that point, um, you know, one of my one of my he geopolitical heroes is Peter Zion. Yeah. And he wrote a book, his most recent one, and he talks about, like, you know, this war was going on, what's happening with respects to the, you know, the Russian invasion, the sanctions. And one of the things is, you know, vessels couldn't get insurance. Yeah. Come, come out of Russia. And like, and if you can't get insurance, you ain't You that can't thing. get insurance. You are not right. It is. Correct. Well, I think, I think You're taking those, a big risk. I think yeah. about those truck convoys in, uh, in Gaza. Like, yeah. I'm like, what the heck? But I mean, that's those are those are international Red Cross. So we we yeah. I'm a board member of the local Red Cross, so we do provide insurance. But yeah. it's exactly that. Like if you can't get insurance, and here's the deal that I you know, if you there's as you know, there's a difference between I don't like my insurance rate; mm -hmm. it's too high. That's mm -hmm. me, and mm -hmm. mine's too. But I have to remind myself that my single family house in Cambridge that I bought 20 years ago yep. has doubled since the time i mean if not more so so the insurance is yeah so the insurance <laughs> is just reflecting yeah what's happened to my to you know yeah. people it's, are moving back to cambridge because it's safer it's more lively the high school's good yep. and then the other is so you know so no one likes their insurance rate all right and and then and then the insurance deserts and that to yeah. me is a difference and if those insurance deserts do in fact ex exist mm -hmm. they are telling us something and and as you know like there's lots of people in 
architecture and land use and all the things that have gone wrong in terms of us preparing for this who are like, yeah, there's probably places we shouldn't live. No, and that's, I'm going to pull up on that exact point. And uh, again, if anybody has a question for Ms. Kyan, please type it in the bottom right-hand corner. I'll bring it to your attention. Ask any question. <laughs> but to your point, and I'll say this, I've had the good fortune to have a Tom Barnett and Tom Shanker on the show recently. Yeah, and I saw that. Thank you. And both are risks. We're talking about climate change. And I was on a panel recently for a statewide convention here in Texas for the Construction Financial Management Association, a bunch of CFOs and the controllers. And when I was asked to talk about, you know, what's going on in the markets and insurance. And I say this, and I and, and Tom says he loves my this quote. You may not believe in climate change, but your insurance company does. Yes. And they are they are for-profit organizations. You don't have a constitutional right to get insurance. Right. And as you say, the exposure, you have you take your value and the rate reflects your exposure. And what the problem is, and you I think you did a nice job of talking about this, there is moral hazard in respects to you think about who's got their dream home. Yeah. Well, most people have their dream home on a beach <laughs> or along a river or on a lake or in the forest. Yeah. Well, all of those, especially these days, are very much dangerous or That's high exactly high right. exposure, you know. And there's there's a great story in the New York Times early in the year about how developers in South Beach couldn't get their insurance for their plants yeah. because you can maybe build it now and maybe it's on the beach, but 30 years from now, it might be underwater, at least the first floor, or at least you're having flooding on the first floor. Right. And, and that's that, 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 surfside, right? Look, yeah. and this is, and this is where, you know, we can blame the insurance companies again. And, and, you know, this is, I, I joke that like, you know, for, for a, for a Democrat, my, my piece sounded a little bit like the wall street journal, <laughs> but, but, um, but, you know, maybe we can find consensus there, but like, you know, the 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 idea that, you know, these things won't change. Right. So mm -hmm. you're building here. And so the like in terms of the public sector, enough to blame on the private sector, like our land use rules, our zoning rules, mm -hmm. our disaster relief rules, all of them are outdated. And so it was the insurance companies that stepped forward and said, I, this is not sustainable. You're letting people build where they shouldn't build. You're zoning for behavior that Correct. you shouldn't be zoning for. You're paying people after the last flood as if there's not another flood in disaster relief, as yeah. if there's not another flood coming. Like everyone wake up. Like this is not sustainable. So, well, and Julie, I think it's a great, I can give you an analogy here. I, have a, I, I predominantly work with my, I work at construction firms, um, yeah. general contractors, subcontractors or developers. I'm, so I'm, I'm part of this process. Yeah. And, in Texas, one of the biggest perils we don't think about is hail. I mean, we're getting nailed with hail, and it's getting very expensive to replace roofs, and carriers are pushing back. So I have a brand new uh, construction firm. They and I, they own the building. I know this because I, I drive by it, and I know about two months ago, they replaced the roof. And I go, oh, okay, that's great. And actually, one of our clients was replacing the roof. And so we had to do the renewal, and we got a new carrier, and then we picked up this client, and we go into renewal. Carriers want to understand the data and everything, and they use satellite imagery and look at things or drones. They didn't really think... They didn't realize or forgot they got a new roof. So with the deductibles and how people price things, they were looking for this, a $350,000 deductible for a brand new roof, uh, for the roof coverage. Oh, no, wait a minute. Brand new roof, more resilient materials. Yeah. Then they gave me more realistic to 50,000. But that is what the whole point is. If you're right. not. And that's, I mean, that, so that's what is, I think, good about the California chain. The, 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 the more recent one is you're going to let insurance companies, um, incentivize owners to mm -hmm. behave better Correct. so if you if you hadn't changed your roof it's going to be this much if you change your roof which is going to protect you and your children or yeah. this is you're talking commercial then it will be a lot less and and that's the way it should work right that's the way people can then rather than these like you know sweeping i'm getting out of the market. Look, I mean, you, you talk about hail. So like in my rabbit hole, um, I learned in Arkansas, one of the reasons why Arkansas insurance rates are so high is because of hail. Well, I would have never known this. Right. Yeah. And, and they're beginning to, you know, the insurance commissioner there says, well, it's Arkansas. We don't make rules, but we nudge. I was like, <laughs> okay. You know, <laughs> it's like, I don't know if that's going to work or, you know, maybe yeah. the, the insurance companies will get you to move a little, we'll get you to go from nudge to rules. But, uh, you know, part of this is our cultural freedom, nope, yeah. norms, our norms for freedom, freedom yes, to be, you yes. know. So again, guests, 
Don't be shy. Type in a question. I, I, think, I think Julie wants the question. So bring, bring some more happy. questions. Look, I'm, I'm chatty today. I, I was <laughs> telling Brian I got my workout in. So everything's uphill from here. All right. I'm going to take every minute I can with you, Julie. So let me know when you got to stop. <laughs> okay, good. So let's kind of pivot a little bit. And we're, we talk about disaster recovery planning, but let's, we think about businesses. But let's think about individuals. And, you know, they're recently in the Wall Street Journal was actually a pretty interesting article about how more and more people are not, let me put it this way. A couple of years ago, people say if they were a prepper, oh, they're a disaster, oh, they're, yeah. you know, they're, they're paranoid. I think everybody's got a better sense now that you really need to at least have the ability to, and I wrote this in an article, go without civilization for five days. And, yes. like, and I put an example, Julie, because I, I used to live in Connecticut, and this is like 25 years ago, and lovely house and everything, but everything was electric. And when the snow came and the branches fall, we would, everything was electric. My house, that my parents' house would be basically one big igloo for five days. No, no water. No pump, no toilet, no heat, no nothing, right? So that's why I said, I'm not going to live. I really don't like long winters. I'm not going to live in New England anymore. And then, you know, Texas loses power for five days. Yeah. <laughs> Which was, but it goes to show things, the black swan can happen. And you're not, the government ain't going to come over the hill and save you immediately. There might be some time frame where you're going to have to yeah. huddle out. That's your long runway. What do you yeah. wish you had had? So it's interesting, Brian. So Brian, I stick to the three days, just like 72 on you, just because it's like yeah. conceptually sort of, you know, it's part of our doctrine. Maybe we should make it longer, like, but 72 on you. And yeah. it's also consistent with, as, as you read in the book, you know, nine meals until anarchy, right? Like yeah. the idea <laughs> that, that if resources don't come in three days, something would have to be terribly wrong for the resources not come in three days. But like if resources don't come in three days, that's that's when you're, you know, water, food. So I'm the same way. And, and I think, once again, I think we make it hard on people. Like even if you do five or three days, like mm -hmm. it's just your basics. I mean, I'll, and I'll, what I tell people, you know, my audience is, you know, like humanitarian relief is very different than sort of what I do. Like the people we talk to, corporations, individuals, people who probably have resources or time. I always say, you know, look, if you don't do this, you're going to take limited public resources that could go to people who can't, right? Correct. I mean, in other words, because 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 you know that they're going to all pay because because we're the cranky wheel people, we're the people with resources, we're the people who know the police chief, like we know. Yeah. And so, thinking about sort of our societal and community obligations to be ready because of the of the resource issue. And I, you know, like, here's the easiest thing. Most people don't know this one gallon of water per person per day. Right. So if you yeah. do three days, that's 50. If I have a family, I have a family five, it's 15 gallons. Yeah. If you do five days, it's what is that number? I don't know, whatever, but um, yeah. I'm not going to pretend, but um, <laughs> so you're 25. So, yeah. so just like, okay, I can make it. That's like a target shop. I can, yeah. I can get there. And then you think of medications and you mm -hmm. think of none of this is hard hard. Like, in other words, it's just like 15 minutes of thinking it through and going to Target or the next time you're at Target or Costco, just getting ready. Like what's going to make you less panic because you've extended your runway. Um, I don't need to tell you what it could be, right? Because I don't care anymore. It's just going to be a boom. Yeah. And of course, people in certain populations certainly know this, you know, hurricane folks and whatever, but it's just, it's worth reminding everyone. So I got another question came in. Yay. This is from Mr. Khan. Uh, prevalence of personal property coverage when it comes to insured, but still not taken seriously by the carriers? Question mark. Adjusters are significantly undertrained in handling UPP. Do you see this trend continuing? I'll Julie, I'll jump on that one real quick. Yay, Brian! I was like, whoa. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I went down a rabbit hole, but I'm <laughs> well, know. I was. I would say this, and this is very. It's, it's a bigger part of the economy. Yeah. We have a lot of baby boomers who are on the verge of retiring. The population as a whole has had less children. So we got less people coming up behind it. And so, and then to this point, people find insurance to be boring or unsexy. And so it's not been an attractive marketplace, which I, like I told you, I found out later, it's, it's great. But I think it's to this part, and maybe you see this as well in other industries, you got this generation, the baby boomers, who are going to retire and there's going to be a big donut hole in labor yeah. for all sectors. And I mean, I mean I'm obviously that That's kind of, right. but that kind of ties into the risk of how that supports social security and down the road and Medicare, and Medicaid, and then people's retirement. That's, that's, that's kind of goes down the road, but are you, from your perspective, you talk about risks 
yeah. and talk to se sectors. Do you see that issue as far as not having enough talent coming behind the senior people? Yes. Yeah. 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 And and the expectations of talent in turn, I mean, you certainly know this, but like how they how they work and and resources. I mean, the one benefit I think of, of this is, you know, I don't, I don't mean to sound old, but I guess I will, but like, you know, all these things about AI and technology and blah, 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 and it's going to mm -hmm. kill us. Like, actually, you know, it's, it's just a means like, yeah. it's just, and one of those means where I think things will be better is in resource allocation, damage assessments. I mean, look at these insurance companies now. They don't need to go, they don't need to send a bunch of adjusters. They can send drones. Yes. And, and so I make a claim that my roof is, that my garage, my you know freestanding garage is gone. Yeah. They like send someone half a day, whatever, just send a freaking drone. Take yeah. pictures, everyone's fine. Right? Well, along, the, along that line, Julia, you made a comment on the podcast, which I really want to maybe talk about it well, but also like using data and technology is like new methods of insurance. And you seem to, because I've been, I drank the Kool-Aid in this one. I've sold it to clients and it's been paid yeah. out. Parametric insurance. Oh, it's so interesting. Yeah, yeah. I'd be curious, you know, I'd be curious your thoughts because yeah. so the people who are into parametric insurance, is, so people who don't know what this is, it's basically like pooled insurance for a community. You have a separate entity, like an NGO, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, let's say you have 30 houses in a community, everyone pays into the pool. If there is a damage of a certain minimum threshold, the money gets distributed without individual assessments. It Correct. sounds smart, right? Yeah. Because one of the one of the things we see in even disaster management pain is is the amount of overhead and administrative costs is taking away from the individuals who actually need that money. When you, yeah. you know, when you hear that the president authorizes, you know, fifty million dollars for this community, like you and I know, like twenty million of it is just going to administrative costs. So I think it's great. I think that the the in talking to other people about like you know, in, in interviewing people like, well, what do you think about this thing, parametric insurance? A lot of them worry about its scalability. Like it'd be very good for say, like, let's say there's 30 homes on a peninsula near the yeah. water, like that yeah. would be okay. Could you do it for a whole city or the seaport district in Boston? I, I don't know the answer to that yeah. question, but that was the concern that people have raised to me. Well, for I've I've actually placed it for some clients for in the construction world because in you know construction, one of the worst things that can happen as far as delaying a project is rain. You get too much yeah. rain. Yeah. So and traditional insurance has not been a way to solve that transfer or that risk and doing insurance, but doing parametric saying, you know, I've sold like say during the course of construction, if I get 30 days of one inch rain i therefore i know my project is way behind x payout can occur on the backside, okay. and it's all about debt and analytics to make that risk transfer which in the past you couldn't do um and then you extrapolate that if you know you've got some company that if the mississippi is down a, couple, a foot or whatever the case would be i can't move material therefore my supply gets interruption that's an exposure yeah. you can place a coverage on that so it, it is very fascinating it's still we're on this infancy stage but we yeah. are seeing more care trying to adapt it it seems, I mean, if you just figure that the market is going to have to adapt in a gazillion different ways, uh, yeah. you know, um, state laws will have to change the industry in, in terms of how it makes assessments like drones, technology, you don't need claims adjusters like you used to, or yeah. you know, these guys like, uh, there's still a TV on ad uh, um, on the air. I think it's all states where like this, this community, oh, it's, I think it was in Florida, like that community got isolated because of the bridge and they show yeah. the guys in the boat, the claim adjusters in the boat, and then they're on bikes and then they get the woman, you know, they're, 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 they're uh, in uh, uh, the woman whose home is lost or like, you know, then they're there taking pictures. And I'm kind of like, okay, that's cute. Yeah. Get it. You know, they're going to go work. But like, like, we can just send a drone over, <laughs> take some pictures, have her on the phone while we're yeah. doing it, you know, what do you, so anyway, but I, I, I think, I think parametric is one of several solutions as we sort of face this world of of of, of monetizing climate change. The time yeah. is now, right? Yeah. And Agreed. if we monetize it, maybe then, um, you know, I mean, yeah. the goal, I mean, insurance is not just after the fact. No, insurance is no. trying to guide behavior. Right. To you minimize got, risk, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You don't buy your house. You don't buy hurricane insurance when the hurricane's offshore. You buy it ahead of time. And you got to think yeah, about exactly. strategically I mean, you're, you're, what you're yeah, And you're trying are, to right? drive that behavior right. 
you know, in a, in a responsible way. I mean, you know, like, honestly, like when you, if you, I haven't gotten a moving a famous last words now, I don't drive that much anymore because I bike ride and walk, okay, but like, okay. you know, like if you're in a car, you know, if you get pulled over, yeah, you're pissed off. You got the ticket. What's the first thing you think of? Damn, my insurance rates are going to you know? <laughs> yeah. You're like, yeah, you know, um, uh, you know you're know, you sort of thinking, I should have behaved better. I should have said. So. All right, I got you for five more minutes, Juliet. So let's do a little bit of lighter okay, side. Okay, good. So when you're not working and thinking about how the world's going to end, what are you doing? Oh, my God, this is an AMA. It's so funny. I do AMAs for um, my students because I okay. think, you know, some of them get nervous coming into office hours. And let me just say, they are like, emphasis on the second a they're like <laughs> like what is you know but no i'm fine to do that so um so i have three kids and okay. but, but two are older so i say that and then i feel like i'm i'm um i'm like cheating like i don't have like physical stuff but like i, okay. I I'm, I'm uh i'm the general of the house um my husband is a is is a is a judge in the federal yeah. circuit and yeah. um and we um you know honestly like it it works because uh, until about two years ago, he really didn't travel that much. He has a new role. He's the chief judge. So he now travels all the time. So we're like at various moments, we'll realize we're both out of town and we still have a kid in town. We're not used to that. Yeah. Um, and uh, the kids are great. And um, for me, I'm a water person. I was saying to you, um, so in, I'm, I'm an unhappy winter person and I have two trips Okay. To warm places already set out for nice. I've learned the hard way in 2020 in early 2024. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm a surfer, I'm a paddle boarder, I'm okay. a runner, and as you know, on days where time is tight, I, yeah. I I go on my on my Peloton and get yelled at with with um <laughs> what, what did one of them what did what did the woman they, the, the the Peloton instructors are hilarious because they each have like their anyone who does Peloton, like they each have their things. So like, you know, one is mean, you yeah. know, like, you know, and then, you know, the other one is inspirational. And I think it was, um, I forget what the, what the thing was today, but they all give these life wisdom things, you know, it's like, yeah. um, so, um, and then, you know, I read a lot. I have lots of friends. I'm very social. I like love, like music. I'm very, I like, I like being with people. Good. Um, COVID Good. was, COVID was good for me because it taught me to be with the right people. But, yeah. um, and so maybe I'm, but, um, and I uh, uh, like to spend time. We have a beach house in, in uh, uh, Rhode Island. And oh, lovely. I, I've been traveling too much. I haven't gotten there in a couple of weeks, but okay. yeah. So everything is good. Got a dog. Nice. She went to the vet. We, uh, this was my crazy morning, like in the yeah. middle of all this, I was like, yeah. I got to take her to the vet, but she, um, and that's about it. So, and we're going to be empty nester next year. So. Well, I've been in I mean, my, both my girls are in college and they're both UT, so I was able to see oh, them. How know, far so. are they? Wait, where? How? Well, how they're both uh, actually, well, uh, eight, just, uh, they're 21 and about to be 25, but uh, long story, they're both about to she'll be graduating in May. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. It's um, weird. I need, yeah. okay, you should do a podcast on like Empty Nester. <laughs> okay. I'd be happy to do that. That, so. that risk is weird. <laughs> I am like, I'm definitely like in a moment. I'm like, it's everything's the last. Like, you know, he takes his, you know, he, like our, our last back to school, our last yeah. pictures. And like, it's hard not to be like whatever. And the poor kid, I will tell you, because because if I'm not traveling, I can sort of manage, you know, I go out occasionally, but I can yeah. manage my weekday calendar. He's gone all weekend. I never see my kid during the weekends. And uh, and um, the poor kid, like his father and I are like standing in the kitchen when he walks in from school, but, you know, like, he'll, you know, he, he works out or he has a newspaper yeah. and you could just see like this poor kid is like, I need space, you know, <laughs> and we're like over him. Like what's going on? How are you? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> All right. Last question. So I mean, I read your stuff, which is great. So, but then who do you read? Like if someone's here watching this in other than your own book, any yeah. book or author you'd recommend? People so, should? I mean, I, I, well, on, on books, actually it's interesting. I'm a fiction reader. I okay. like, I like fiction. I yeah. it, it gets me out of my space, um, and I am a nonfiction listener. So I sort okay. of have this division. In fact, whenever I try to listen to fiction, I sort of get annoyed because I, I like my brain to go past the na narrator. So um, uh, and so I yeah, I read probably like two or three books a month. I'm pretty good on that just because I'm walking the dog and can listen and stuff. Um, and so I like you know what are, what are the most recent nonfiction. I read the big King biography by Jonathan. Okay. Eag. I'm, uh, I'm, um, now reading, 
Um, oh, actually, I'm reading. I just finished Lawrence Wright's new novel. Oh. Um, called Mr. Texas. Yeah, it's, yeah. He, he yeah. was actually at. He was actually yes. at the. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, he was at it. They gave his book to a thousand people. I'm like, I didn't get this gig. Like, whatever, two thousand people. Um, and um, uh, um, I'm reading the uh, next novel. I'm reading is called Father Priest. It's uh, okay. it was, it was I, I, um, it's pretty good. And so on the current events side. Honestly, my days start with NPR. In yeah. the I wake up early, so it's just like in the background. I just catch up that way, yeah. and then I, you know, scroll the big newspapers. I'm I used to be much more engaged with Twitter. It just it's not doing. Yeah, it. it's fallen off. Yeah, yeah, it's really unfortunate, especially in our field when something happens, you just yeah. can't yeah. follow it. I'm trying to get so I follow like sort of all the big reporters, and then you know, I, uh, for good analysis, I I do I try to read across the board. So I I mean yeah. I read the Atlantic because I think they're just superb and have so many really are. different yeah. things yeah really and then um and then we'll read you know i'll sometimes you know read conservative stuff and i read the wall street journal just to like get a sense of 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 everything around there and stuff yeah, absolutely. and try yeah. not to get too involved with like you know my world with like trump stuff you know it's like is you can be you know you can get too you can go down the rabbit hole in that one yeah yeah i mean <laughs> for me the trump stuff is relevant not every court case and stuff for me the trump stuff is relevant in terms of the radicalization issue which i do worry about like violence and stuff yes. like that yeah. um so yeah so that's that's so like today i you know go into campus and post in the happy hour for my well, students good. yeah good. i'm nice yeah. well that's good and Julia. I Thank you so much for your time. I know you're saying Oh, Brian, this was great fun. I'll, yeah, this is great. I get to I, go back into the rabbit hole. I'll let you know <laughs> if I if I if I if I go back down. Well, if any have questions that can help you on the insurance side, please give me a call. I will. I will. will you <laughs> Thank you so book? much. Will you write the book for me? No, I'm joking. I haven't we'll decided it. yet. Okay, we'll I'll do, see you later. We'll do it together. Bye, Julia. Bye. See you later. <laughs> So everyone, I hope everybody had a, a great time listening to that uh, conversation with Juliet. Um, obviously, she is a world-renowned expert with respect to disaster recovery plan and business continuity management. Um, you know, like the whole, we should tell my clients, you want to think about the worst and plan, think about the worst and, and hope for the best. Um, you know, hopefully it doesn't happen to you. But again, having the event is not the time to come up with your mitigation strategies or your business continuity plans. You want to think about your risks, look at it holistically, find out where your, your strengths are, find out where your weaknesses are, and try to come up with the mitigations for your weaknesses. And again, guys, you may not believe in climate change, but your insurance carrier does. So like all things, guys, I hope you enjoyed the show. Um, if there are certain individuals or topics you'd like to see on this show, please send me a note or email or post it here on LinkedIn. I'd be happy to fo uh, follow up and make it happen. And also you can subscribe to my channel on YouTube to find this episode and all others as well. And until next time, guys. Bye.